Hi, my name is Tamo Nakahara. Uh, thank you for joining us to this uh, free workshop where we've got two hours blocked here where we have a great variety of talks um, and hands on all to make sure that um, you have sort of a nice history of what Kubernetes and how GitOps is part of this Kubernetes uh, evolution that we'll be talking about. We have a fantastic talk that Kingdon here will be uh, giving. And then we'll actually make sure that you don't just learn about it, but be able to execute um, and have something to take home with you. So hopefully, if you're here for that, uh, you will have that by the end of this. My name is Tamo Nakahara. I lead a developer experience team at a company called Weaveworks. Um, and then we also have uh, David Stauffer, who is one of our PMs, uh, who will walk you through this. So uh, hopefully you are here for that. We would love to hear from you in the chat. Uh, let us know uh, if there are any particular challenges that you're looking to solve today. Uh, we are here to help you answer all kinds of questions that you have. So hopefully you can do that with us. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, sorry, I guess Stacy. Oh, thanks for advancing the slide. Um, so we have Stacy here, who's our community manager, who puts together these wonderful events. Uh, Kingdon, David, and I, we all work for a company called WeWorks. Um, if you haven't uh, come to these before, welcome. Thanks for joining us. This is um, part of a wonderful series that we've been running for several years um, that has, oh, excuse me, one second, grab the thing, that has all kinds of intro talks, advanced talks, uh, talks on open source technologies. Um, but generally, we are um, very focused on making sure that we help solve your problems around the spaces of uh, what's come to be termed as GitOps um, and progressive delivery. And so much of that is because of our history um, in open source. So maybe if you'd heard of us before, you might have heard of our earlier projects such as Scope or WeaveNet. Um, and then we've had many others, um, primarily uh, if you've heard of Flux, uh, which is in the CNCF, um, and Cortex, which um, makes uh, Prometheus scalable. Those are some of our core projects that have advanced to the point of being part of the CNCF or the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And um, the project Flux is a lot of what we're going to talk about because that really is the project that we first created for our own use, um, but then led to us coining the term GitOps um, and really seeing so many people um, benefit from it as well. Uh, you might have heard of the project Flagger, which we also fl folded into Flux because um, it uses Flux, but also is not dependent on it and provides what's uh, now been kind of coined as progressive delivery. So that's sort of like um, um, canary deployments, blue green, um, all that good stuff, leveraging um, metrics from Prometheus or other um, metric sources um, and using so much of the core of what we're talking about, this Kubernetes space and um, sort of this flux technology to bring that to you. So we'll touch upon some of those things. And if any of that seems like something that uh, you want to use to solve your problems, we're happy to help you. So if you've never heard of us before, our website is weave.works. So uh, check us out. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping on this uh, workshop. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, I'm really glad to have here with us Kingdon and David and Stacy put this together. Um, we usually block off two hours for these, but we generally finish within 90 minutes. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we'll have different parts where next we'll go into the intro and then we'll do the hands on and we'll have different little kind of mini um, things to share as we go through that. Um, and so hopefully you've brought your laptops and you will follow along. So, um, oops, sorry, a, a housekeeping thing about Zoom. Uh, when you're in the chat, that'll be the primary, primary way that we talk to you. So just reminder to make sure you, for the two, choose a little drop down and says everyone. Um, so that way, um, you know, uh, unless you have something burningly private, um, you can uh, uh, participate in the conversation, ask your questions. And a lot of times, um, you know, we get a pretty good large group and people are answering each other's questions. So that's also wonderful as well. So make sure, uh, take a moment right now to go into your chat and choose the everyone uh, from the drop down because otherwise, um, we will uh, copy and paste your, your comment unless we notice it's something uh, very private uh, just with your initials. So appreciate that. Um, okay, so the agenda, as I mentioned, um, next we'll be um, moving to Kingdon, who will give you a lovely brief, um, but hopefully helpful um, intro to Kubernetes and GitOps. So if you're brand new to Kubernetes, hopefully it gives you sort of just enough that you need to know to sort of understand this particular part of it. Um, if you 
are looking to get more help on getting started with Kubernetes. We've been using it in production for, at this point now, uh, over seven years. So we've got all kinds of great people um, within our company that's committed to your um, cloud native journey and being successful. So uh, please uh, reach out to us, we're happy to help. Um, and then within this context, King Dan will talk about how if you've heard of GitOps, um, kind of learn a little bit more what it is and why it is that, you know, this form of GitOps is a natural evolution of where Kubernetes um, has gone. And, um, you know, ask us any question. There's no dumb question, so please uh, let us know. And then after that, what we're going to do is uh, I mentioned the Flux project. So Flux is a CNCF project that's open source, um, and it's really the core tenets of um, getting GitOps as well as a lot of other capabilities. Um, we also have a thing called Weave GitOps that um, uh, has a component that's free and open source. And we use it as sort of a teaching tool so that you can get started with Flux. And if this is your first time and you're kind of coming in new, it takes away a lot of the decision making. So we're using it as a teaching tool, again, free and open source um, that you can go take away with. And it'll set up things like your directory structure and it'll have like a really opinionated way of doing Flux because one of the great things about Flux is that it's very unopinionated. But for people who are like, really brand new. Um, we think it's a great way that like in 30 minutes, you'll have uh, your cluster and all the things set up. And then um, over time, we'll continue to work with you so that if you start going like, oh, this is exactly what I wanted for this cluster, or actually, now that I've learned more, you know, I think one cluster will use this, but another one, I think I might start working toward the open source flux, um, because I have a, a different thing that I want out of it. So like we're supporting all of the above and um, want to make sure that you are successful during this session uh, and afterwards. Um, all right, so we will um, share some of these links in the chat so that you'll be able to click on them. Um, but just giving you a heads up that, as I mentioned, we'll be using this thing called Weave GitOps as a teaching tool. Stacy will share this link and we'll be just going through the getting started steps. And then once you're getting started, we'll show you a lot of the like shiny things that come out of it, like disaster recovery based on um, GitOps. And um, we'll talk a little bit about um, the directory structure because that's a common question that we have. Um, and uh, hopefully answer all of your questions. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to our wonderful um, engineer as part of our developer experience team, Kingdon. Hello. Kingdon, uh, Kingdon, as well as Stacy are coming from the some of the snowy parts of uh, the US today. And uh, take it away. Yeah, here we go. Okay, thanks for a great introduction. Tamo, I'm Kingdon. Um, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, I'm going to start, uh, as we've mentioned, with a brief introduction to um, Kubernetes and GitOps. Uh, here's, here's my intro slide. Uh, we've already heard I'm an open source support engineer. Uh, forgo that part. Okay, so uh, brief outline. We're going to start with what is Kubernetes, um, since not everyone is familiar with Kubernetes, and we're going to move on as we um, get to the end of that uh, and dovetail, uh, find out how it dovetails with what is GitOps. So starting with Kubernetes, uh, the, the sales pitchy way to say what is Kubernetes is your modern operations stack for the cloud. Um, it is a way to run container clusters. Uh, so you build container images and you run them on a cluster of computers. Um, that is uh, at a glance, what is Kubernetes? Uh, Kubernetes is also an API, which is important for developers or programmers who are building um, software on Kubernetes, uh, like the Flux team and the Weave GitOps team. So you have uh, namespaces and pods and services. And if you're not familiar with these ideas yet, you will certainly be familiar with them soon. Um, these are the core ideas in Kubernetes. Uh, there are a lot more in the core API, though, uh, even in the core API itself, there's events and secrets and config maps. Oh my. And you have facilities for uh, managing applications together and storage interfaces and uh, coordination, uh, such as leader election, lots of things built into this API that are facilities for building a distributed system, since that's what Kubernetes is. Um, lots of different uh, moving parts. We're not going to cover them all uh, in an intro to Kubernetes talk, but uh, these are all terms you'll get familiar with if you're working with Kubernetes in the future. Um, and also uh, there's more. 
since the core API is just what's built into Kubernetes, uh, we want to build things on top of Kubernetes like GitOps. Uh, there is an extension API called a custom resource definition. So you can define your own resources besides these, the, these core types. Uh, we'll get into some of those later. Uh, but when you, when you define resources uh, as Flux does or as uh, uh, we do in, in any controller, um, you build an operator or a controller to manage those resources um, in the cluster. And we'll get into what does that mean exactly. But um, so uh, we're still in the summary of where we're going to go. So GitOps is the thing to wrangle all of that complexity, since this is really an awful lot for anyone who's new to Kubernetes. We'd like to make it simpler and straightforward. Uh, where do I start? Um, so part of GitOps is the cloud native best practices for Kubernetes that are part of GitOps, um, which starts with Git. Uh, Git is a version controlled uh, immutable storage mechanism for your configuration or for anything. You can put any sort of files in Git and you're probably familiar with Git already, especially if you've come to this talk. Um, so Git and ops are the two parts of Git ops. Uh, operations, of course, is uh, referring to the idea of continuous delivery and uh, declarative configuration. Um, so this is an automated way to deploy declarative configuration onto Kubernetes clusters. Um, okay, we're gonna go into a little bit more depth about Kubernetes before we get to the details of GitOps and what it is. So Kubernetes, we already mentioned, there is an API. Uh, there is a control plane to support that API. All of Kubernetes is open source um, and it's a platform for operations. Um, I mentioned the control plane here to make it distinct from uh, your workloads. So there's the control plane is what is the software that makes up Kubernetes and runs Kubernetes. Um, that can't be all there is. You obviously have your own software that you wanna deploy on those clusters. Um, and that's the most important thing to you, I'm sure. So we'll call that the data plane. Um, and those are your workloads. Um, so it's uh, useful to highlight that there are different experiences possible. Um, Kubernetes is a, a standard platform, but it has some divergence in the way that it is experienced by people that use either self-hosted or managed versions of Kubernetes. You can run Kubernetes uh, as it's provided by a cloud provider, or you can run it yourself since it's open source. And uh, those can be vastly different experiences depending on um, your expectations for what you will have to manage. Um, you can also have different experience with Kubernetes depending on whether you're using it for development and testing or for a production environment. Those can also look very different from each other. Uh, but in, in common, they generally have this uh, concept of conformance with a standard that is called Kubernetes. Um, so there's a conformance test that all these different Kubernetes implementations can run and uh, show concretely that they are really Kubernetes and not some other fork or different implementation that's incompatible. So um, part of Kubernetes is that there should be this um, consistent experience ac across all cloud providers. In fact, you might even be able to move your resources from one cloud provider to another, depending on how you uh, build your um, configuration. So uh, about uh, what is happening when Kubernetes uh, does its control plane thing, uh, well, there are controllers uh, in Kubernetes that are reconciling your cluster toward a desired state based on your configuration. Uh, so we describe, for example, deployments in our declarative configuration, uh, and we uh, apply them to the cluster, which then, uh, drives these controllers to react and say, okay, I need to make that the new actual state. So controllers are driving the actual state of the cluster towards your desired expressed state. So what does that actually mean uh, in terms of a concrete example? I thought we would start with a bad example since um, sometimes a bad example is a good example. Uh, what is it that makes this example bad? Well, we're saying we'd like to run one process, a pod, uh, and a pod running is sort of an imperative thing. Uh, the controller will take care of that for you, um, as we'll see on the next slide. 
Uh, but pods have a life cycle of their own, and it's important to understand how a pod works uh, to understand Kubernetes. Um, and, and also to understand that the pod definition is not really declarative. So uh, the life cycle of pods has this, uh, it would be good to have a diagram here, which states you can transition to which other states from, but you can imagine it starts in pending state, uh, then it hopefully goes to running. Uh, at some point, it either terminates or fails or uh, it, it uh, succeeds. Uh, maybe it doesn't do any of those things and it's supposed to run continuously like a server. Uh, those are all possibilities with a pod. Uh, but when you call it, it runs, and that's an imperative behavior. So this is a bad example because in Kubernetes, we don't want to specify anything imperatively. We want to specify everything declaratively. So what do we do instead? Well, we create a deployment resource, which has a path that goes through something called a replica set, and it creates pods. So the deployment We'll say, I would like to have X or N number of pods here. I've used N. Uh, that's how many replicas. And then there's a template for the specification. And as, as we go uh, through these objects and try to understand what is Kubernetes and what is it actually doing, it's important to understand what the replica set is, uh, but we don't really need to go into detail about it today. Uh, it's, it's basically an immutable specification, like the pod. So when you create a pod, you can't change it. Um, you can delete it, you can create another pod, but there's no um, mutating of a pod. You can't change what it runs uh, because that would violate the whole concept of the life cycle. So when you create a deployment, you uh, associate a specification for some pods with um, the state of the deployment. And as the deployment progresses, it will bring those pods up. And as you change the deployment spec, it will bring up new replica sets uh, with, with the new specification. So these are immutable artifacts and um, they're also flexible. So uh, we use these declarative primitives to uh, rescue you from the lifecycle of pods, uh, which is a little bit difficult to grapple with as a, a newcomer to Kubernetes. Um, so I mentioned that pods can be used for other things. Um, you can use them for jobs that run once or cron jobs that run on a schedule and repeat or uh, stateful sets. Uh, you can use stateful sets when you have some persistent data. So deployments are usually stateless. Uh, stateful sets are, are stateful. Uh, and all of these are managed through control loops. When you declare them, the Kubernetes controller manager is actually the thing that comes in and it drives these resources toward their declared state, desired state. So back up to what is Kubernetes? What does it mean for you and how will you use it? Well, you start by declaring your desired state, then you apply it to your Kubernetes environment and control loops take over from there and uh, create primitives uh, so that you, you can um, have your cluster in the desired state. So, how does that play with GitOps? Well, in a single sentence, what, what I would describe GitOps in, in terms of that um, leader is what would it look like if your entire cluster system state was represented as a single artifact? Um, and the spoiler is that artifact is the Git commit. That does not have to be Git, but um, we start with Git since that's uh, right in the name and it's, it's pretty central um, to the concept of GitOps. Uh, in GitOps, you take your Kubernetes YAML manifests and you put them into the Git repository and uh, they're applied from that. Uh, so there's more to it than that. But if you've understood that much, you've probably got at least 80% of the way there to what is GitOps already. So, uh, so that's great. So if we want to understand in full what is GitOps, we have to go to the principles. Uh, and this is uh, open gitops.dev. I should have a little reference in the corner there. But if you want to go see these principles in context, that's the website where they're published. This is something that was put out by a uh, group called the uh, GitOps Working Group. And uh, it's part of the Open GitOps Project. So uh, this is um, how we describe GitOps uh, as a system. Uh, so it's declarative resources. We've already talked about that. And versioned and immutable, 
that's that's when I say it doesn't have to be Git. It can be any sort of um, store that has those properties um, where you have an immutable uh, configuration that is represented in the shape of snapshots. Um, so like an S3 bucket can do that. And uh, it's pulled automatically into the cluster, which is to distinguish from a uh, traditional push model where like in a Jenkins CI CD, you might uh, build your image and test it in Jenkins and then push it directly to the cluster from there. That's not what we're doing in GitOps. We're pulling uh, configuration from a source of truth and we're reconciling it into the cluster. Um, we'll get more on that later, but uh, so this is a continuous process um, and it runs continuously uh, on an interval. So every 10 minutes, let's say, or every one minute, uh, the state that's in the Git repository is reconciled against the state in the cluster. And if there's been any changes, then the state that's in the Git repository should win and override any drift, configuration drift. So that's part of GitOps too, is reconciling configuration drift. So the benefits for your business are greater visibility, improved security and uh, compliance. Um, so just to straightforwardly, if you are using GitOps uh, for your configuration, then it increases the visibility because anyone can go to Git. They do not need special access. Um, they don't need direct access to the cluster. You don't need to give anyone uh, permission to write or even read from the cluster itself um, in order to interact with it and, and uh, develop and build on it. Uh, people can just go to Git and, and open a pull request and, and push their changes to the cluster. And this also has compliance benefits because uh, as you uh, build your changes in Git, you're also building an audit trail. So you get that for free. Um, for developers, sometimes uh, there can be a burden uh, when you're adopting Kubernetes and all of your developers don't necessarily understand how to work with Kubernetes. So uh, the benefits for developers are, are easier streamlined deploys. Uh, even if you don't necessarily understand how to work with Kubernetes, you've probably already had to learn how to work with Git. Um, so it, in a lot of cases, we find that it's easier for developers to um, be onboarded to Kubernetes through GitOps than just to go and learn Kubernetes directly. Uh, so you don't need right credentials for your cluster. Um, you don't need to be able to change things directly. You don't need to worry about where you were because uh, the state is in Git and you can refer to it any time. Um, and uh, it, uh, it lowers the barrier to getting onboarded to Kubernetes and, and working with Kubernetes. So for platform teams, there are also distinct and separate benefits. Um, as a platform engineer, you always want to follow the principle of least privilege. Uh, and this um, method definitely makes that easier to do. Uh, so your developers or uh, your platform team no longer have to write these custom scripts that they will then be on the hook to maintain that go and apply your changes to Kubernetes. Maybe something happens and they have to change the way that works. Uh, well, we're, we're taking care of that. Flux or Weave GitOps are, are built for um, as trusted open source solutions that you can use uh, to do that delivery and, and you don't have to build it yourself. Um, and as far as uh, permissions, you don't need to give your developers any permissions to the cluster, but uh, you certainly don't need to give them right access anymore. Uh, and that's also true about your platform uh, for deployment. You can um, simply replace it with Git and let those declarative uh, configurations be pulled into the cluster by an agent. Um, this also makes rollback very simple because in Git, you have a revert. That's something you can do to your commit and um, put it back the way it was. And uh, that's really straightforward. That's another thing you don't have to build. Um, so it's easy to track changes and it's a uh, standard for how you deliver your software. Uh, so in summary, this is sort of restated. What were the principles? Uh, a little bit simpler. You have declarative configuration, uh, core concept from Kubernetes. You have your version controlled immutable artifacts, maybe Git, uh, and that's your single source of truth. Um, and, and those are the core concepts of GitOps. Uh, 
Uh, also, it should be automated. So if, if uh, it wasn't clear enough from these three points, it has to be automated. Uh, and then here's sort of a little diagram where your developers are working with Git. And there's something that synchronizes the changes from Git into the cluster. Um, and there can be communication between here. So this, whatever this thing is, it's observing the state of the cluster. It's changing it based on the difference between these things. Um, that's, that's GitOps at a glance. So our declarative resources are automatically delivered into the system and they're reconciled by agents that run in the cluster. Uh, also, it might be in a closed loop. This is, uh, you can also have a concept of uh, breaking the glass. So I, I've mentioned repeatedly that you don't have to give people right access. You don't have to give systems right access. That right access can be useful in case of an emergency, but you shouldn't be using it every day. That's kind of the point of GitOps. So, uh, so this is uh, pretty much everything we covered uh, in summary. And um, those are the benefits of GitOps and, and how it dovetails with Kubernetes. Uh, I think we are at the question stage, uh, unless we need to move on to the next section. Thank you so much, Kingdon. That's great. Uh, yeah, I was just posting in our chat, uh, anybody who joined, for those who join later, um, we have the Zoom chat. Uh, please make sure you choose uh, to everyone and ask us any questions. Uh, currently, just a few responses were a good overview, no questions. <laughs> um, anybody else? I'd also posted earlier, you know, no, don't need to be embarrassed, but, if, you know, who's brand new to Kubernetes? Uh, just so we can make sure that we tailor you know, the, the various components of um, this workshop to make sure everybody's successful. Um, happy to help people on uh, their various stages of uh, becoming cloud native. Um, okay, so one question, would you deploy any supporting Kubernetes objects like ingress controllers in GitOps as well? Fantastic question, thanks. That is a great question and I would. Um, I, I personally use GitOps for uh, absolutely everything that I can. Um, so where we draw the line is sort of between um, uh, intents, I guess, is, is uh, the way that it's explained uh, most concisely, is when you have uh, an idea of what you want to deploy to the cluster, that's an intent. Um, and uh, so if you, for example, uh, like a certificate manager plugin uh, that Kubernetes has, you can deploy certificates or you can have them created for you. Um, so if they're created for you, you probably wouldn't um, include them in your Git config. But if if you uh, the cert manager itself, you know, or ingress controllers or things like that, anything that's infrastructure, yes, apps, yes, all that stuff goes in GitOps. Awesome. Yeah, let us know if uh, we answered your question. Um, we have a, another good question here, which is, uh, you know, how do you compare? Um, this weave GitOps versus Argo versus Flux. So fantastic question. So um, certainly um, I'd say, you know, our Flux project and uh, Argo CD project are probably the two most visible ones within the CNCF um, that kind of cover this area of GitOps. Argo people are good friends of ours. Um, actually, Kingdon and I had some nice hangouts with them over at KubeCon. It's always great to see them in person, especially during COVID because we, um, even though I'm locally close to a lot of the Argo people, haven't seen each other in person since COVID in a while. Um, so yeah, great projects, um, different things. Also, I think we had a really nice comment from a, a TOC member that said, you know, in a lot of ways we do sort of talk about this GitOps area, but both projects also cover very, very different areas, right? So one of the TOC members was saying like, I kind of almost see them as different kinds of projects as well. So within the GitOps space, certainly there's um, different um, you know, use cases, um, if, if your company or the particular place that you want to use one of these CD offerings, you know, has just certain criteria, you have, you know, you're very opinionated what you need, definitely shop and, and consider both of them. Um, they have very different, um, you know, both are incubating projects and both have different kind of pros and cons. Um, that said, of course, you know, as I mentioned, we created Flux and we're very excited that um, we are, you know, very close to reaching graduation within the CNCF. We went through the external security audit, which was really gratifying to um, see that, you know, our architecture is sound, our dedication to security is sound, um, and that's why we have so many 
um, enterprise customers uh, and small customers using Flux. Um, and then uh, very importantly, um, Stacy can share links with you that um, we did an event in October that showed how basically most of the cloud providers, a lot of the major um, distributors uh, or distribute GitOps using Flux, right? So that's huge validation, like, like Microsoft, AWS, D2IQ, the Mesosphere people, um, VMware, and Red Hat were all sharing their solutions that, you know, showed how much they could trust Flux as part of their, um, as the core part of their uh, GitOps offering. Um, so, you know, we'll definitely share those with you and, you know, hopefully we convince you that uh, the hard work that so many of our team and uh, other companies and the community has done has uh, really been paying off. Um, and so now for Weave GitOps, thanks for asking. Um, so as I mentioned, um, Weave GitOps is sort of a, a range of different things. We're going to show you the free and open source bit that um, we feel is basically a good teaching tool. Uh, like I said, if you're if you're coming into Flux, but you've done sort of your homework, you know exactly what you want, um, you might go straight to Flux. Um, but for a lot of people who are just, you know, maybe in this camp, you're like, you're just Kind of wrapping your head around Kubernetes, uh, we felt like uh, Weave GitOps offered a great way to just set everything up for you, and then over time you'll continue to learn and you'll decide whether like what parts you like, what parts you need to change, um, and then of course uh, there's an end uh, uh, enterprise level as well. So if you start wanting the bells and whistles, it kind of creates an easy path for that. But plenty of people can stick with the free and open source version and, and take advantage of that as as a great starting point. So I hope that answers that question. Um, all right, another great question. When you deploy an app with GitOps, uh, can you take advantage of, sorry, I hope I can, can you take advantages from deployment strategies like blue, green, or A-B testing? Yes, that's a great question. I mentioned Flagger in the chat. Uh, Flagger is part of the Flux CD umbrella of projects. Um, and it is a progressive delivery tool uh, one of one of the first, maybe um, the first for Kubernetes. I, I don't want to say that definitively, but um, Flagger was announced in uh, February 2019, which is very early in terms of progressive delivery, um, and it does have blue green and A/B testing strategies, uh, which there's a link in the chat. Yeah, it's pretty good stuff. It's really fun to see at various events. Sometimes people we don't even know are out there, you know, using Flagger in their demos or in their talks. And so we all kind of connect and see great ways that they're using it. Um, I know you answered in the chat, but I think it's good to have it uh, for uh, the discussion and um, the recording. Uh, another great question, does Flux somehow manage um, to handle the CRD updates? Uh, yes. And um, so it, in uh, Flux itself, uh, you have the customization resource where um, that's where most things are applied from. Uh, and as you apply customization, it'll put a CRD first. So you can uh, install your CRD and resources that go together with it. And you can upgrade your CRD um, just by updating it in Git. Uh, and there are also um, the concept of with Helm releases, this is a really popular feature since Helm itself does not support CRD upgrades. Uh, that's really complicated um, for folks that are trying to deploy operators with Helm. Uh, well, the Helm controller actually does support that. And there's a section in the configuration where you can um, say what to do on install or on upgrade, and that's configurable. Excellent. Um, another question, uh, what are the required resources to run Flux? For example, is it possible to run it on a Raspberry Pi cluster? We don't have uh, minimum requirements listed anywhere that I'm aware of, but I am actually certain uh, because I have my own Raspberry Pi cluster that you can run Flux on a Raspberry Pi. Um, the uh, Raspberry Pi 3 might be too small um, unless you have multiple of them, but the four, you definitely have enough room with four gigs of RAM. That's more than enough to run Flux and all the controllers. Excellent, cool. Uh, and then next question is, um, you know, is it possible to migrate from Weave GitOps CLI to plain Flux? Um, absolutely. So, um, and we, I think of it less as like migrating from one to the other, but hopefully, you know, we have users who have many different clusters. And so depending on the requirements of that particular cluster, um, that is something that we are dedicated within our company to make sure that that experience should be as smooth as possible. In fact, I think going from Weave GitOps that's more opinionated to quote unquote plain flux is probably easier in the sense that, um, you know, you're going to something that's much less or almost barely opinionated. 
um, it's the other way around that, you know, we've been working hard to say like, okay, so if people have done a lot of custom stuff with their flux setup and all that, if they want to move to a more opinionated path, then, you know, we're working to make sure that that user experience is positive, that there's good documentation. So that's something we're definitely working on. The kingdom looks like there's maybe a show and tell about to happen. <laughs> This is my Turing Pi cluster. I actually have a couple of these, but this is the one I've been using to test uh, Flux ARM64 support until uh, we got we got some resources from Equinix Metal uh, oh, to yeah. support the testing in the cloud. But this is what I started with. Cool, very cool. Um, yes, uh, and thanks for the responses there. Um, in fact, for people who are looking to learn, certainly um, Stacy has added the link to join um, our Slack channels. Um, so we should be clear too. So we have a CNCF in the CNCF Slack, we have a, a Flux channel because um, that's in the CNCF, but we're also sharing links to our Weave community Slack where we have a dedicated channel for Weave GitOps. Um, but either place, uh, we are in both of those places, happy to help across anything. Um, like I said, Weave GitOps is built on Flux. Um, so really, um, in fact, we'll be um, shifting gears a little bit so like, I think the flux components will become even more visible in the user experience moving forward. So I think that it'll help people to get a clear understanding of like how the two work together um, for different types of users, right? It's not, um, it's really where you are on your journey that we wanted to have a variety of offerings that um, can help you be successful from your starting point. So whatever you have, give us feedback. You know, we're here to take all the feedback and improve, improve, improve. So let us know. Um, if any other questions come up that came up from this, don't be shy. Keep putting them in the chat. We will continue to address them. Um, at, th at this point, we will shift gears to the actual hands-on part, uh, for which I'm glad um, I would be partnering with uh, David. Uh, I'm going to sort of start with a little bit of like keeping you focused. Hey, on the um, turkey dinner, <laughs> I call it sort of because um, you know we'll be going through steps and hopefully you all have your laptops with you you're ready to go um, we still have a full um, chunk of time here 90 minutes and so if anybody's stuck please don't be shy uh, we will make sure that um, we get you through it so stacy has shared the getting started link so you can kind of start linking on that um, uh, but we will walk you through all the prerequisites everything if you haven't gotten started yet no worries at all um, so since we'll go through the steps, it's always good to always keep having that vision, right? Like, you know, because at one point you'll be like, wait, what? I forgot, what did I come here for? So I'll just kind of keep reminding you of like the end goal. Um, so let me share my screen. Hopefully I can get my slides to work. This one. All right. Can people see the turkey dinner? It says yes. yes. All right, great, thanks. Um, all right, so as I mentioned, you know, it, it's helped. It's helpful to like keep reminding yourself, okay, why am I going through all these steps? So I'm just going to highlight some of this turkey dinner, um, kind of reiterating on the benefits of GitOps that you know Kingdon was sharing. Um, this is really the goal. We'll talk about the the business and the you know technical uh, benefits, so that hopefully. We are here to solve your biggest problems. Um, and if you have some of those biggest problems, please uh, feel free to share them in the chat, either to everyone, or if you want to be private, you're certainly welcome to just share it with us. Uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, for the people who join later, we all work for a company called Weaveworks. Um, and really, we are committed to your cloud native journey, your successful cloud native journey. Um, and so we um, have people on my developer experience team out there in the open source communities. Um, we have built this project product, like I said, called Weave GitOps on Flux, on CNCF Flux. Um, and that product is part of our dedication to making sure that you are successfully becoming cloud native. Um, and so as part of that dedication, you know, the product is very much um, Kubernetes um, based and in this case flux based so it's really native in that way, and so we want to make sure that through this you have a very consistent uh, and GitOps beneficial uh, management and operation. Um, um, way of doing things, so we have many companies that have been at an enterprise level that have been benefiting from um, the GitOps methodology, and so we have both um, a product as well as our open source team, as well as a professional services team. So whatever level you need, we're here to help you. Um, so to reiterate um, what Kingdon was saying, right, the 
benefits to GitOps are uh, incredibly things, you know, velocity and then security is a primary, primary concern. Um, we've had talks uh, from many people in the past at our GitOps days talking about the importance of reliability, lower downtime, ability to troubleshoot, you know, have a, a, an audit trail when things go wrong. Um, and all of those things are connected to the business value. So um, we've had a great talk from our previous CTO. We talked about the DORA metrics. And so this has kind of become an industry standard where they looked at companies that seem to have business success, you know, faster time to IPO or to get revenue or to um, get investment, et cetera. And they saw um, direct connection to velocity. So it was really about the companies with the best velocity were able to succeed in these various areas. And that's why we are so committed in making sure that we are um, helping in those areas. And we've already had so many companies see those benefits from the GitOps methodology and from the tools like Flux um, that apply that methodology that we've put even more effort in making sure that people are having success on that journey. Um, and so for the tool that we'll be using, as I mentioned, you know, we are very much dedicated to making sure that the developers are successful, but actually also the operational teams are successful. So we've basically created a way in which, uh, as I mentioned, it's Kubernetes native, it's Flux native, it's a platform that we're building to make sure that everyone has the most positive user experience and can get through their stages. And we walk through people through this um, and what we call the GitOps maturity model. So, you know, if those of you who are here and brand new, you're just kind of dealing with single clusters. Here's a different kind of turkey dinner, right? That it'll get you on this journey where by the top you're doing like more complicated like team based management. You have, you know, multi cluster, multi various things. Um, as we talked about with Flux, Flux is multi everything, multi tenancy, multi cluster, multi etc. Uh, we will help you get you on that journey, and so that you can get the um, both technical and the business benefits of this. Um, and so here, just like I mentioned, um, many of you might be at the lowest level here, which is no problem. You know, we're dedicated to bringing you there. And um, as Kingdon had shared earlier, right, the four principles of GitOps um, that now have been officially sanctioned by uh, a CNCF organization, the Open GitOps Group, um, so many of our advanced users were like, yeah, there's four principles, but you know, you go on your journey. So don't be scared if you're like, oh my God, I, I can't shift to these four principles. Um, many people, you know, they just say, start with the easiest one, start with what works for you and just keep, you know, moving forward. And many advanced users still probably only fully engage with the four, uh, uh, three out of the four principles, but still they're getting so many great benefits and, you know, they are, um, quite mature in terms of this GitOps maturity model. Okay, so with that reiteration, you know, it's for both apps and infrastructure. Um, it's about um, developer velocity and automating, automating, automating. That's definitely something we've heard so much um, from advanced GitOps users. They're like, look, my team is working on things that use their brains instead of doing manual things. Or, you know, they're no longer on their pagers on Saturdays. They're able to actually work on investing toward the future. And that keeps the teams more excited and, and in the company. And then just having something that's resilient and reliable, right? Like all of those um, come into play. And so as we now shift into like the very, very nuts and bolts of getting you started with this, you know, keep all these things in mind that hopefully you are in the beginning or in the middle at some part in your journey to um, really take advantage of this. One last thing I will um, mention, um, I, I don't know if King did mention it, but you know, we talk about CICD. Um, one of the most important things is that, you know, all of our tools work with what you already have, right? So um, if you've uh, invested in Jenkins or whatever, you're, you're not tearing them out. You know, this is very much complementary with what you already have. So we're happy to help you with that. Uh, so now, hopefully, you have your laptops and you're excited to uh, get started with uh, getting on this journey or advancing on this journey. So. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be working with CNCF Flux, um, but we're using this um, component of Weave GitOps that's free and open source as a great teaching tool to get you, like, depending on how fast you are, as, early, as, as short as 30 minutes, you'll have um, everything going and you'll actually be doing GitOps. And then we'll show you some ways in which um, that will benefit you like disaster recovery and uh, get you there. So David. 
hello hello <laughs> so um i'm gonna talk you through the the getting started guide and we're gonna um getting GitOps and Flux set up on a cluster. And then like, like Tamo already mentioned, we're gonna, we gonna deploy something real to it, a workload. And then we're gonna do some scenarios and, and this will really show you how GitOps can boost your confidence in, in how you deploy things. And therefore, when you, you have more confidence, you can really improve your Dora metrics so let's get started. What we need is I, I will start to share my screen. Um, yes, that's the correct one. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this getting started guide. So I invite everybody to visit this URL. It's docs.gitops.vaf.works and clicking on getting started. And we will need some prerequisites. So you need a GitHub account. You need kubectl installed to, to access your Kubernetes cluster. And what we're going to use in the getting started guide is basically a kind cluster. Any Kubernetes cluster will do. So if, if you want to use Minikube or you want to use your, your EKS cuttle and use the EKS cluster, feel free to, to use any kind of cluster. In this guide, we're gonna use a, a kind cluster that requires Docker. So Tamo, what do we do? Do we want to wait that everybody confirms if they, yes. they yes. are ready yes. and yeah. have this prerequisites? Absolutely. So yeah, no worries for everybody. We'll go through the prereqs with you. Um, frequently, not everybody has a GitHub account. Um, I also know this works with GitLab, correct? So if anybody's using GitLab, um yes. also i think did we confirm bitbucket no. bitbucket will not work okay. um it requires basically in this version the sas version of gitlab or the sas version of github so great yes, so as well um, gitlab on prem will not work okay great so um yeah please uh either raise your hand or let us know in the chat if uh, you need to get this set up it only takes a few minutes, so it's not a problem. Um, and then additionally, um, if uh, GKE is fine, it's a question. Yeah, uh, as well, a GKE cluster should should work. OK, and then, oh, yeah, we've had the question before, too, right? We've had people do it on EKS. Um, I don't know if I've been asked yes. about EKS. Um, and so, it, yeah, exactly. So if you. For example, if you're using EKS and others, you don't have to do the kind step, this, the prerequisite number three. You can just work off of um, EKS. Um, and then don't be shy. We've definitely had people who also had to you know, install Docker, which actually wasn't as painful either. And I know the kind step is quite quick as well. So um, I see some people are saying they're installing the kubectl, which is, don't have to say sorry, no problem. That's great. Um, so, okay, good. Thanks for all the feedback. That's always very helpful. So just to repeat, um, I don't see any hands for setting up a GitHub account, but um, if you're doing that, no problem. And then yes, kubectl getting installed. Do you want to click on the instructions for kubectl? Um, just so we walk people through it. Yes. So kubectl you will need to select basically um, if you want to install it on your Mac machine or your Windows machine or your Linux machine. So um, in my case, it's a Mac machine. And what I would need to do is probably since I'm using as well homebrew, um, which is very nice, I would go to this and execute the command brew install kubectl and I will be fine. Um, so I think the Kubernetes documentation in general is quite good. So you can see here at different ways and as well, a way if you are using already Apple Silicon or using an Intel chip. So yeah, this shouldn't be too hard. Great. All right. So we have one person confirmed that the kubectl installation has completed. Excellent. Um, let us know anybody else who hit any snags. Uh, and then the final part, as we mentioned, um, the 
kind installation is pretty quick. Um, I do know one person in the past who had to install Docker and uh, our workshop was lengthy enough that I think they caught up toward the end and was actually able to get up, get through the steps. But yeah, let us know if you have to get Docker installed uh, and kind installed. And reminder that if you um, are using something like EKS, uh, is it the same with GKA? You don't have to install kind, is that correct? Yes, a Kubernetes cluster, right? So yes. the, this is what, what we need. And um, as as... if well. you don't forget, you need, of course, to, to set your, the kubectl context in a way and with the kubeconfig that you can basically then access this cluster. Um, so the question is, uh, is it possible to do this on Windows? Uh, yes. In fact, we were just looking at the kubectl install, and there is a Windows option. Uh, David, anything we should know about the other steps? I think people have done it on Windows before, so I think that's yeah. fine. Um, and so we have a Fedora users. Uh, I'm confused why most of Kubernetes related binaries are available through Homebrew, but not available through Deb RPM repositories. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's definitely an interesting point. Um, good to know. I'm not sure about the history and the culture that has, has led to that. Um, okay, so we have a question that Maybe we'll pause for uh, later on, but thanks for posting that. We'll look into that. Um, okay, yeah. All right. Okay, I think uh, please raise your hand if you still need a few minutes. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be pausing in different places throughout, but we have plenty of time and we, you know, our goal is to make sure that everybody finishes and, and feels successful and has something that they can play with. So. I'm definitely here to make sure that happens and totally fine to help you through um, either through the chat or, you know, pausing here during the, the talk. So we have, we will not have succeeded if we went ahead and went all the way to the end and nobody uh, was able to follow along. <laughs> so, um, okay. So with that, why don't we get to the Weave GitOps uh, setup? Yes. So the first thing we need to do is we need to install the VF GitOps CLI. So you, you copy this command, this curl, um, and you, you do it into your console. I already have it installed, so I'm not going to execute this command because actually my bandwidth is quite slow and I'm not too keen to download it right now, but this okay. is what you need to do. And then as a next step, basically what we're going to do is we need to create our configuration repo. And for this, we go on GitHub. We click new repo. You need to be locked in, of course. We're going to give it a name. The name we're going to use in, in the example guide we're going to do is GitOps config. Why do we need this repo? In this repo, basically, we're going to store our, our automation code. So it will store basically the configuration that we have set up for, for Flux. And, oh, this is the wrong tab. So I'm gonna use the, the name we're gonna use in the guide. The only really important thing is you need to do is you need to initialize this repo, right? So you can do this very easily if you add, for example, a readme file. And what this will do is we will have a branch and a branch is quite important for, for our VF GitOps setup in this getting started guide. So we're gonna do this. And here we are, we have initialized our GitOps config repo. We can see that this is our great readme we, we committed. Um, even if there's not much, it was enough to initialize the repo. And what we need to do as a second step is we're going to go to this, this repo. And this repo, interestingly, contains the, the deployment.yamls for, or the deployment YAMLs for the pod info app. And the pod info is app is this great app that as well our DX team and Stefan wrote. And this is the app we're going to deploy. This is the source code of the app itself. 
what you see here is basically the deployment.cml that instruct Kubernetes to, to install this application or this workload. What we need to do with this, what we, because oh, this is what we want to do. Can we pause one yes. second? So just to clarify, you're saying that the initial steps that you went through um, with this setup automatically included this pod info sample, sample app for people to get started? Is that what happened? So yes, we are here at step two. So in step two, we're gonna fork the, 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 yeah. the, repo, the repository that includes basically the deployment instructions for Kubernetes. Got it. Um, so, great. So if we could pause just one second, I know that some people were, um, and I really, really appreciate when people give feedback here so we can get a sense of what's going. I know um, one person had to update kind. So that's great that you already had kind, but need to get updated. Um, Anybody else? I know we kind of went through a good number of steps. Hopefully people got their GitHub accounts set up. They got logged in because we needed to have a, a login for those steps. Um, and then we created the readme. Okay, kind cluster is running. Thank you so much for telling us, appreciate it. Uh, anybody else got stuck? And don't worry, we've definitely had people like 30 minutes in um, go, uh, <laughs> I'm still creating a GitHub account. No problem at all. Um, okay, we have some questions. Uh, so we'll be working on the Weave GitHub CLI. So the question again is, does it work for Windows? Yes, I think um, you need for the, the Windows version, there's a different um, binary you need to point the curl command to. Um, let me see where I can find it. What was the name? Yeah, get off. One second. And I think if I go here and releases, then you basically you need to point the curl command to the right um, binary, to the right table. I think maybe King then can help in the background. Or which one? I'm afraid I don't see a Windows binary there. I think. Um, yes. <laughs> I think you have to use WSL, Windows oh, yeah. subsystem for Linux. I think someone did that in our previous one of our previous workshops. Sorry not to clarify that. I definitely know they finished. Yes, I'm wondering. We had a, a table for Windows. I don't know where where's it where it went. I will leave this feedback. That's it's okay. weird. So yeah, apologies for that. Somehow has uh, disappeared between today and a couple of weeks ago. Um, okay, we'll see if maybe Kingdon on the side can uh, look into that a little bit. Uh, in the meantime, we got the question again about um, GitHub versus GitLab or Bitbucket. So the answer was, um, you can do this with GitLab uh, as long as it's not on-prem. Did I get that right? Uh, and then, yeah, right now for this particular kind of workshop, we don't have it for Bitbucket. To, to be very clear, you, you can use all of them with if you just want to use Flux with the product we are educating you today. This is currently not possible. Okay, so I guess can they do, I, I shouldn't say this, but they could do an earlier version of uh, Weave GitOps where we did have it listed in the assets. There are two different topics, right? The Windows topic is one, and then oh, we have basically the supported Git providers. And the supported Git providers, if you oh. just use Flux, there is a bigger set of Git providers we just support. Um, but with this, basically, this the VF GitOps version that does um, help you to set up some stuff. It only supports certain Git providers. Got it. Yeah, sorry, I had moved back to the Windows topic. So thanks for that. Um, okay, so thank you for that. It looks like people have got their um, clusters going. Um, yeah, apologies for the Windows thing. We will follow up with you, but hopefully you can. Um, watch these steps and then um, yeah, hopefully 
uh, for the person who asked about GitLab, your version of GitLab will work. Alternatively, um, hopefully you can use uh, GitHub for this exercise. Thank you so much, everybody. So next step is we need to fork this repository. Um, we're going to fork it here and I'm going to fork it to my personal account. Why do we need to fork it? Because we're going to as well commit some changes to it and we're going to change some, some stuff when we go through some scenarios. So this is why we need to fork it. Um, if you're done with this, we, we, we go actually to the next step. And I have seen that somebody of you did this already. We're going to create a cluster. Time create cluster. And probably this will take a second on my machine. And then as the next step, we're already installing we have GitOps um, onto the cluster. So let's see what it does. It's bringing up the control plane. If you are looking at my, my right side, I can explain this quickly. I have already set up two watchers on my cluster. I'm watching two namespaces, the pods there. And I will watch basically this the namespace Vigo system because here you will see how all the flux controllers will come up. And later on, we're going to use this watch watcher to see what's going on in the namespace where we're going to deploy our pod info app. And yes, this is the reason why we have set up already this extra windows. So we're going to set our cube cutter context. And from here on, we are ready to go. So now comes one of the first critical steps, which is basically we're going to install VF GitOps onto the cluster. And we're going to con co copy this command. And the important part in this command is that here we are specifying basically our config repo. And this is basically the URL to it. And you need to replace the username with yours. And this needs to match you the, 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 the repo name, right? And if you remember, I called it GitOps config. If you have called it different, you need basically to, to adapt to this. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy as well this command. We're gonna paste it and um, I need to move this. And I'm gonna change the username to my username. Um, and that's basically it. I'm gonna execute it. And now the first thing is we need to authenticate with GitHub. And we need to provide this token. Continue, and we're gonna authorize basically that it can access our GitHub account, and this should pick up. And now it's starting to generate and verify its installation. And now you can see that our controllers are coming up, and. This are the different flux components. We have the Helm controller that I think Kingdon already talked a bit about it. The image automation controller, a customized controller, the notification controller, and the source controller. And yeah, once they are all up and running, we basically, we will verify that everything is finished and we are ready to roll. Yeah, so good chance time to uh, mention here. Um... So that's kind of part of the, they use many controllers. First of all, as King did mention, is kind of how the, there's the design in Kubernetes. And then in Flux itself, it just shows sort of the microservices architecture that we have there, right? So there's all these different components where the controllers do different things. 
which also on a community aspect uh, makes it easier for us to troubleshoot when people have challenges um, and it makes it easier for people to contribute. So if there's a particular controller that um, you start looking into and you're using it, if you notice anything in the docs or if you notice any challenges, um, you know, hopefully it is uh, um, easier to, to help there. I'll also do a little plug here that within our company, we started doing sort of these um, controller runtime workshops for people who want to learn about that. So that if there's anybody out in the broader community that would love to um, learn more about controllers, or maybe uh, you find, like some people we knew, they said, well, technically I've written controllers, but I had no idea what I was doing. It'd be really great if I could be part of a community of people who um, are doing that together. But well, we're certainly uh, happy to help there. So uh, it's just sort of a community thing, so let us know. Um, so a few questions here. Um, sorry, this was posted just to us, so I know it's not shared with everyone, but are these, is it, it's asking the GitOps install config repo, git at github.com, username, etc. Is this pointing to the app source code or config repo, um, which I think, oh, okay, so the person figured out it's, it's the config repo, but yeah, good to share in case um, people weren't clear about what was going on. Um, and then I just want to make sure this might not be the right time, but I just want to make sure I put this question out there so that I don't forget about it. Because I know earlier on it was bookmarked as a, a question to ask later. And um, sorry, I'm just going to go through the, oh yeah. Uh, so just plugging here, David, if there's an appropriate time to talk about it, but the question was, um, would these be configured as .sh or Golang files as part of the pipeline, which is recommended? Uh, so that was from earlier on, but I just want to make sure I stated it here. So at the appropriate time, you could uh, address that. All right, thank you. We are all already, yes, we will do this. Um, let's, we are almost there. So let's wait, oh, give it one second. No problem. In fact, it's good because I uh, think I really appreciate people sharing. There's one person who's um, working on the Docker install. So again, like I said, we've had people at various prerequisite stages, no problem. And um, usually most people are able to catch up uh, throughout. That's why we take pauses. Um, and if not, um, uh, or if people have to leave, um, Stacy has shared the link to our Slack channel. And so we've definitely had a few people come there later and they're like, okay, I, I just have a few final steps. You know, I, I got stuck here. So we'd love to continue the conversation. So, so just let us know. So now comes the, the spoiler from Kingdon. And this is why um, this, this is um, requires some deeper integration with GitHub because what VF GitOps did is creating a pull request against our config repo. Now we can do what this pull request did. So let's go to our repo and check this out. It provided directly the URL, but um, we can as well see it here. So it wants to add a lot of files. So, and it wants basically, it sets up this initial automation and the customization and basically the source and we're going to merge this and this will have set up our basic setup so let's go back to the conversation and from there on we are ready to roll into the next steps and if we know go, go back to our repo we see that we have set up this directory structure which gives you as a user a bit a kickstart because it considers already a lot of stuff so in the system we have everything that we need to to automate um, the the system itself and in in user we can start to put our own applications and stuff we want to have in this repo all right so let's then go to the next step, which is we're going to access the UI, which we do here with GitOps UI run. And this executes this wonderful UI, which runs on your local machine. And here you have a button to add an application. So we need to give it a name, for example, pot info deploy. 
um, we need to say what the source repo is. We need to, ah, um, uh, no, where the, yes, we need basically to, this was fine. Here we go. So we need to set our config repo URL, which is, you remember, the GitOps config one. We need to set what the branch is and the path. And when we are there, we have as well the option to say we want to auto merge or we want to authenticate with GitHub. And we need to authenticate again with GitHub. So we're going to do this again one more time. And authorize it. And if we now submit this, we can see that this created as well a pull request. And at once, it's asking us to add basically pod info deploy to our repo. And it's gonna setting up the, the source and the customization files. And we're gonna merge this. And this should bring up in a couple of seconds, it's apps. All right, uh, Once. Good, good time to check in. So we had one person at an error uh, who did this in the wrong branch. Um, are you able to address this? I guess you're saying best way to stash and start again in the correct branch. Uh, I'm yes. sure that just I mean, happened before, so. I mean, where was the branch wrong? Um, I'm looking to... Okay, so um, yeah. sorry. Um, sorry, if someone's posting to the host and panelists, but yeah, we you know don't want you to have to rewatch the video and do it later. If there's a step yeah, back, we yeah. can go to. We're happy to review again. Don't want to end up going too fast that you miss something. Um, so there's also another question. Uh, it says, authorize Weave GitOps dev. Will this allow WeWorks access to my private repo? No, this is. I think, no, I think you can set very specifically the scope and it's called out in this dialogue and you can even change the scope. So I would need to open the dialogue again and see what it does by default. But I think if I'm not totally wrong, the scope is quite tight. Um, but if if you want to be sure, double check what what the dialogue asks you to give you access to. Um, I would like so, to try to address the wrong branch issue, but not sure. Um, you know, let us know which steps. Maybe we can go back to the getting started guide. And just check to see yes. where maybe we went too fast, or <clears throat> if anybody else is. So yeah, before we got to, I assume this is before we got to the UI, of, or was it within the UI that we did it in the wrong branch? Let's see if there's a comment. And anyone else have any kind of unexpected errors or? Okay, raise your hand if uh, you have burning so issues. Otherwise, you, you can, yes, you can see now two things. We, in the namespace test where we instructed in the deployment.dmls to bring up pod info it's up and running the back end and the front end and we have as well our wonderful ui um, let me check i think where we can see if we go to applications again and we go to our application we can see basically here's this graph 
and all the resources which are tied to pod info deploy. And they're all green and healthy and up. And we can as well see our source condition and our latest reconciliation, our automation commission uh, conditions. And we can see that the reconciliation um, succeeded and the Git operation succeeded. So everything is happy. We can see what is the latest fetch revision and the latest applied revision. And they are equal, which is good. Um, so basically, the latest what what it was fetched is as well applied, and we can see the latest history of commits. So everything looks good, but I think this was all. Yeah, let's see what is next in our getting started guide. Um, yes, we're going to use the UI, but let's quickly set up this port forward. In a more serious setup, you would probably have kind of an ingress, which and it's just a bit different, but we can now go to this URL and we can see pod info is up and running. So we we deployed successfully in through Flux and GitOps this, this application. And now I think we're gonna start um, with some more interesting value propositions. So the first interesting thing you could observe was what I think King then mentioned it in his presentation, but we, we didn't really interact it directly with our Kubernetes cluster to deploy this. We made it, we deployed, we, we set up something in our config repo and this made in a GitOps way and this made sure to, to deploy this. So this means depending how you want to set this up, but your app developers or your developers, platform operators, they don't need to directly interact with your Kubernetes cluster where you don't have an audit trail, you direct you interact with Git and, and this gives you a different kind of, of knowing what is happening. Um, yeah, so the first thing we're gonna do is let's imagine we have a bad actor, right? And what we can do is we can deploy, for example, a pod. So human error, right? This happens all the time somebody directly interacts with the Kubernetes cluster and does a mistake. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna deploy, we're gonna delete the front end. And here you can see it's terminating, right? In my watcher. So now it's gone. And um, if I would now, if I'm quick enough and I re really need to be quick, this should not be running anymore. It's, it's dead, right? But now the, the wonderful thing is that GitOps will make sure that now what we have synced into the cluster, this is what Flux does, is not really anymore true with, with what is declared. And in a couple of seconds, this pod will basically come up on its own again. And here you can see that basically Flux took care of bringing up, seeing that something is not right and making sure this pod is coming up again. And now, Basically, our this system should be. Oh, yeah, I need to basically set up the port forward again because the port forward is dead, which makes sense. Um, but basically, we didn't need to do nothing and it came up again and alive. So, this shows you a bit how you can be confident if you're doing GitOps, even if something goes wrong, that um, you're in a different state. So another scenario we're gonna play out is let's let's assume you want to make a desired change and let's make assume you want, for example, somebody made, you, you want to change in this case, the color of, of pod info in the front end. And what we're gonna do is um, you can do it however you want to do it in, in terms of um, flow, what you can use the favorite code editor of your choice. What you need to do is you need to go to pod info deploy to your fork because this is what we need to apply the change. And this is basically where, for example, you, you, you would normally interact with. So you can clone this to your local machine or whatever. And what we're gonna do is, um, where is the UI color? Yes, here we have it. So we're gonna edit this file and we're gonna edit the environment variable here, which sets the pot info UI color. 
and we're gonna change it to the proposed change of this value, which I think is gray. Um, let me see where I have my editor, and it can be any. Yeah, I mean it can be any any editor of choice. I don't think this needs to be explained too much. And we are good citizens, so we're going to not directly commit this. We're going to propose a change. We're going to have, we're going to create basically a pull request. And now we have some, some peer checking and let's assume this is, oh yeah, this is a good change. We want this, it gets merged. And here we go. And basically the next thing which will happen is if Oh, look how quickly it picked up. So Kubernetes is already bringing up the new pod. And once this pod is up, it will start to shift traffic and it will terminate this pod. Um, and again, our pod for water collapsed because we this pod doesn't exist anymore. So we need to set this up again. Um, like I said, in a normal setup, you would do this a bit different. And now our app is changed its UI color. And let's assume this desired change introduced a problem, a bug, and, and you see your metrics are not looking good. You, you're, you're hitting a lot of errors. So there again, we, we're gonna highlight in a very simple terms, there's a power of GitOps. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our repo where we did the change. Um, we're gonna go on pull request. We see this closed one. We're going to open it up again and we're going to say revert this change. We need to revert, right? Is this introduced a lot of, of bugs? We need to do something. So we're going to again create a pull request to, to do this. You could as well directly revert it. It's really up to you and the governance processes you have in your company. You merge this pull request. And basically, with this, it's it's done. We're going to roll back this change in a couple of minutes. So um, again, it it picked up very quick. So you can see that Flux directly picked up this change. You can change actually the interval, how often you want um, Flux to to check if if there's something new in the Git repo, or you can as well poke Flux manually through a command in the CLI or in the UI. Again, our port forwarder died, so we're gonna set it up again. And if we go now back to the UI, we, we roll back our change and we have some blue background again. And this is basically two very simple scenarios to show you really what the power of GitOps is. And this is basically where we complete the simple getting started guide. Questions? <clears throat> yes, we got a couple things uh, in the background. Thanks to Kingdon answering a couple of things here, um, more specific. So actually, I was just in the process of uh, messaging you to see um, if we do something slightly different today, because um, we can officially wrap up and if um, and, and stop the recording. And if anybody wants to, like, you know, troubleshoot the final bits. I think I have two people who had like particular things that we could um, help with on screen. I'm happy to um, officially wrap up and the recording. And then, you know, if anybody wants to do that, we're happy to do that here. Um, so I think we've addressed everything. There are people sharing some errors and stuff. So uh, any final broad questions? Um, I think I see here. Oh, apologize. I think we have addressed any broad questions to the overall goal. So I'll sort of summarize here that, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we're here to um, address any challenges that you have very broadly. As I shared, it's really important to have security, velocity, reliability to not only have effectively running apps and ops teams, but to actually have uh, business benefit. Um, GitOps is certainly one of the ways that um, you can achieve all of these, and we know many enterprise companies who are already um, benefiting from the business and the uh, technical um, capabilities of GitOps. Uh, 
hopefully, as you'll see, you know, Flux and its, you know, very close stage two graduation and its success through the security audit shows that it's uh, really been a best in class and enterprise project that um, has been validated um, from the outside. So that's very exciting. And um, hopefully this exercise is a way for you to get started with Flux in an opinionated and kind of encapsulated way so that you don't have to make a lot of decisions up front or have to do a lot of research. You can kind of get it going first and then, um, you know, get you um, successful over time. So um, with that, um, unless there are any broader questions, I'll officially uh, end this recording and uh, we're happy to help people online. So thank you so much, uh, Kingdon and David, uh, for the overview and thanks for the very active group and the many uh, questions in the chat. Um, and so again, thank you for joining and I will uh, stop the recording. <laughs>